The state of North Carolina is farm country. From small family farms to people who make a living from the land, farming is a big part of the state's economy. There are beautiful sprawling acres of farmland for the eyes to behold. It is a place where coyotes and deer roam the forest and venture out from their homes in the woods ever so often. One may chance to see a wild turkey wandering about on the highway or a fox in the city limits. Perhaps such events occurred on Christmas 1929 in Germantown, North Carolina, where nature was the backdrop for one of the most shocking crimes to ever have happened in the state. Charlie Lawson was a working class farmer. His parents were sharecroppers. This was a normal lifestyle for the time. It was part of North Carolina's culture. Charlie met and married Fannie Manring in 1911. They worked together and saved their money to buy a rundown farm in 1927, close to his brother. They had eight children in total. Marie, 17. Arthur, 16. Carrie, 12. Maybell, 6. Raymond, 4. James, 2. Mary Lou, four months old, and their third born, William, died at age six from pneumonia. Charlie was a devoted father, strict at times, but he took care of his family. The winter of 1929 was tough in Rockingham and Stokes counties. The Great Depression had set in, and to make matters worse, they had to suffer through a deep snowfall, making conditions even harsher that Christmas. Through it all, the Lawsons worked together as a tight unit. In the evenings, Charlie and Fanny, who was 37 years old to his 43, 16-year-old Arthur and 17-year-old Marie worked on renovating the farmhouse. In the process of removing rotten timbers, Charlie accidentally hit himself in the forehead with an axe. Accidents were common on farms, so the family carried on. After this horrific accident, neighbors and family noticed a change in Charlie's personality. He was said to have complained to his doctor about severe headaches and insomnia. His behavior was erratic. Following the accident, Charlie took his family in his truck for an impromptu visit to Winston-Salem. He bought them all new clothing. This sudden spending spree was unusual for the Lawson family. Charlie instructed his family to remain in their new clothing for a trip to a local photography studio where they would sit for a family portrait. It was a Christmas surprise he had planned for the family. The townsfolk were bewildered, but this was nothing compared to the mortification they would feel when he would do what he did to his family a few weeks later. Christmas Day, 1929, Marie woke up early to blend the butter, sugar, and egg whites roll up a cup of raisins and flour and pour the mixture into two cake pans. This would be her signature dessert for the day's festivities. While she was baking the cake, Charlie, Arthur, and Charlie's two beagles went out on a hunting expedition. They ran out of ammo, so Charlie sent his oldest son to Germantown to buy more. With his father's permission, 16-year-old Arthur walked with a friend to Walnut Cove for the ammo. Some people speculate Charlie feared Arthur would intervene and stop him from doing what he did. Back at the farm, Marie was finishing what she was doing in the kitchen. Carrie, 12, and Maybell, 6, decided to go visit their aunt and uncle nearby. 
This was a trip that never happened, for unbeknownst to them, their father was waiting by the barn. He shot his daughters, and to make sure they were dead, bludgeoned them with a hoe handle. Charlie then returned to the house and shot his wife, who was on the porch peeling potatoes for their Christmas dinner. Charlie shoved more shells in his shotgun, swung open the front door, and pulled the trigger on his oldest daughter, Marie. Marie slumped to the floor in front of the fireplace. Charlie reloaded, then shot James, who was two years old, and Raymond, who was four. Charlie then turned his attention to his newborn, four-month-old daughter, Mary Lou. He bludgeoned her to death. After this, Charlie went into the woods with his dogs, Sam and Queen. He stopped to wash his bloody hands in a creek. Footprints show that he paced in a circle around a tree, perhaps for hours before he ended his life. Just before sunset, a shot rang out, signaling suicide. The echoes of the gunfire had barely faded before the howls of Charlie's dogs led searchers to his body. Police found two notes in Charlie's pockets, letters to his parents, and on a crumpled scrap of paper, blame nobody but I. In rural North Carolina during the 20s, rabbit hunting was a popular sport on Christmas Day, so gunshots like those that rang out as Charlie killed his family could have been taken for granted since they were pretty commonplace out in the country. Relatives discovered the bodies late in the afternoon when they visited to wish the Lawsons a Merry Christmas. The scene of the crime was a horror. The cabin's rooms were soaked with blood and the furniture was in disarray. Charlie had placed all but two of his victims' heads on pillows and folded their hands across their chest. For his first two victims who were found in the barn, he used two stones from his tobacco barn as headrests for the two daughters he shot and bludgeoned outdoors. There was so much snow on the steep hill leading to the Lawson cabin that it made it hard to climb. So family members, friends, and deputies had to transport the bodies wrapped in borrowed bed sheets by a makeshift sled to hearses parked at the main road. The first funeral home they delivered the bodies to in Walnut Cove was too small to handle embalming and autopsying eight bodies. So the corpses were reloaded and motored through snow to Madison's Yelton Funeral Parlor, located above Penn Hardware Company at 104 West Murphy Street. The Stokes County Coroner who presided over the autopsies on the night of December 25th, 1929 was Dr. C.J. Hesselbeck of Danbury. The brother of Stokes County Sheriff, Dr. Spotswood Taylor, an intern who just happened to be home for Christmas from John Hopkins Medical Center in Baltimore, helped with the inquest, working into the wee hours with Dr. Hesselbeck. Dr. Taylor assisted Dr. Hesselbeck in removing Charlie Lawson's brain for examination. Charlie's brain was taken to Baltimore for a more in-depth analysis at John Hopkins. The initial autopsy reports noted that Charlie's brain was relatively small and that a portion of the center of the brain seemed underdeveloped. The slayings attracted a lot of attention. An estimated 1,500 spectators attended the funeral. December 27, 1929, five hearses lined Murphy Street where huge crowds gathered to see the seven lost in caskets loaded for transfer to the funeral at a mass grave at Browder Cemetery near Germantown. Eight bodies were embalmed, but only seven caskets were buried. Infant Mary Lou was laid to rest in her mother's arms. No one knows for sure why Charlie murdered his family. The mention of a Christmas surprise led some to believe the act was premeditated. Some blame Charlie's head injury. 
Others speculated that Charlie had witnessed an organized crime incident and that he and his family were murdered to silence them. Another theory was that some witnesses and family members reported that Charlie killed his family because he felt ashamed for impregnating his oldest daughter, Marie. In 1990, a book titled White Christmas, Bloody Christmas was published and brought this motive to light. A relative by the name of Stella Lawson had been interviewed for the book. She called the author and said that she had overheard Fanny's sisters-in-law and aunts, including Stella's mother, Jetty Lawson, discussing how Fanny had confided in them that she was concerned about an incestuous relationship between Charlie and Marie. Jetty Lawson passed away in early 1928, so this meant that Fanny had been suspicious of the incest at least a year before the murders took place. Another book by the same author titled the Meaning of Our Tears, published in 2006, added more support to this theory. It is revealed in this book that a close friend of Marie's named Ella May disclosed that a few weeks before Christmas, Marie told her she was pregnant with her father's baby and that Charlie and Fanny knew about it. No autopsy report ever detailed Marie as being pregnant. Soon after the funerals, Charlie's brother opened the crime scene for macabre tours. The cabin had been left disheveled and blood-stained for authenticity. The exhibit even featured the cake Marie had baked but had never gotten the chance to serve her family. Marion Lawson defended his decision to offer tours of Charlie's home claiming he needed to raise money for his orphaned nephew, Arthur, to use to settle the farm's mortgage. Among the thousands of visitors to the house from across the nation was none other than the infamous mobster, John Dillinger, freshly escaped from prison. He reportedly took a detour to Germantown with his girlfriend and a criminal associate while en route to Florida. John is said to have left a note on the door of an area lawman, mocking him for missing the America's most wanted of the era. In the wake of this tragedy, strange stories of premonitions, curses, and ghosts were rampant in the Germantown area, especially as the son, Arthur, died in a freak truck accident in his early 30s. Over time, the Lawson cabin was demolished. Today, Madison Dry Goods, which used to be Madison's Yelton Funeral Parlor, features a museum that includes the rooms and memorabilia from the mortuary service. May their souls rest in peace. All of this is alleged. Thanks for watching.